Hey guys, how's it going? Michael Troy here. Very excited today. We have a uh, fresh perspective from a sometimes unheard of part of the comic book world. Uh, one of the most amazing decorated colorists in the comic book industry, Jose Villarubia. Not only is he a colorist, he's an amazing artist in his own right. Highly decorated. If you have not heard his name, you definitely know his work. He's worked with some of the greatest legends in the industry. And I am so happy and thrilled to talk to him today. So welcome, Jose. So nice to see you. How are you? Same here. I'm very, very happy to be here. Oh, good. I know, um, you know, it's funny because, uh, you know, I, I love comic books. I love comic book art. And, um, you know, I, I'm an artist myself and I've recently started like coloring other um, artists work and it's definitely given me like a new appreciation for colorists. I mean, I think that coloring um, is definitely one of those uh, things in comic books that is taken for granted. And I feel like it's one of those things you notice it more if it's bad than if it's good, if that makes sense. Yes, absolutely. I think that, um, I think since I started working in the industry, um, artists already found that coloring of their work was really important. And I think there was a big transition uh, when uh, personal computers became available and everybody could actually use Photoshop to color their work. And, um, but I mean, I feel like I have always gotten recognition uh, for my work since I began in the industry. And people like Warren Ellis made comments when, you know, I first started on my first job on Hellshock. And uh, when I started working at Marvel, Blasinkevich and uh, Brian Kevon made comments. So, you know, I think that professionals have been paying attention. I think some of the fans that really care about the process have been, and some just you know, they really don't, they just want to read a good story and they don't really pay too much attention to that. Right. Um, so I was curious, because you mentioned uh, this, like, Hell Shock, uh, uh, you know, you're large, you're associated with uh, Jay Lee a lot because I think that's when you really got a lot of your recognition was Hell Shock, but you worked with him before that on, um, was it the Sentry stuff at Marvel? Was that your first collaboration with him? No, my first collaboration was Hell Shock for Image. Oh, he, okay. um, once he uh, left Marvel temporarily and started working at Image, he was given a chance to create his own character and uh, that was Hell Shock. And I did not know Photoshop then. So uh, for the first mini series, I did color guides that another artist copied um, digitally, which I thought was insane because I didn't know Photoshop. I didn't know how to use a computer, but I knew that you could just scan the painted pages I was doing and overlap the line art to them. But the other artist said that was impossible. And so instead, what I did is I went back to school and uh, I learned Photoshop. And the second Hellshock series, I did painted colors and I scanned the colors directly, like as I knew it was possible to do. Um, so, uh, w uh, growing, obviously, you loved comic books growing up. Um, what, like, but you're a you're a classically trained like fine artist as well. Like I've seen a lot of your photography and um, some of your paintings and things. Um, one of the things that I loved uh, that you posted like some drawings. Uh, maybe it was just one drawing of uh, when you were like maybe five years old. And I just love that you still have that art. It just shows to me that you must have had parents that were nurturing and your talent and your love of art and just the fact that you knew it was special and to hold on to it for all this time. So um, what inspired your art or how did you begin to know that your love of art and when did that translate into comics? Well, those drawings that you're referring to, uh, my parents didn't keep. I was lucky that I gave them to my grandmother for safekeeping because I think almost nothing that I did survives. Uh, we moved so many times. Uh, by the time I was 12, we had moved 11 times. So 
most of my things that I did as a child were lost, except the pieces I gave my grandmother. Um, I think that my mother is an artist. She's a photographer, and she used to be an amateur painter. So she's always had a lot of art books and how to do art books in the house that I used to devour. Um, I was the kid in the class who could paint and draw, and like it was just fun to do because I could do it. And um, my parents were both very supportive of for me to pursue a career in the arts. Um, and um, so I did. I studied fine arts in Spain and then later here and eventually got a master's in painting. Um, and when, uh, like, when did you start reading comic books? Because uh, you're from Spain, were, were you introduced to them at a young age or? Yeah, in my generation in Spain, all children read comics. There was, I didn't know anyone who didn't read comics. Uh, they read children's comics. There were a lot of special characters that were, that were published for children, uh, humor stories, and everybody read those. And then everybody read Tintin when I was little. Everybody read Asterix. Uh, all the children did. Um, Mafalda, which is uh, stripped by an Argentinian cartoonist. Um, and eventually, uh, I started reading Marvel and DC reprints. Um, and and then I just subscribed to Marvel series to have them sent to me in English because the Spanish reprints were in black and white. So basically, there was no time when I started to read comics. As soon as I have awareness, I was reading comics, but so was everybody else. That was There was nothing unique or ex exceptional about that. It's just the only thing that's unique is that I never stopped. Right. <laughs> uh, so when did you uh, like start working in comics and what, like, did you originally want to be a penciler or did you, uh, like, was it an accident? I mean, sometimes I know that happens where you recommended, uh, how, like, what was some of your first work in comics? I did work for um, Spanish uh, fanzines when I was 14, 15, 16. Um, I did a contest for an important newspaper there named Ya, uh, which belongs to the Catholic Church, and I won the first prize, and it was a story I wrote and illustrated and painted. And so, yeah, I knew I wanted to do that, but I didn't know how. So when I was 17 or 18, I sent my portfolio to Marvel and DC, and I got rejected uh, with a form letter. So then I pursued a career in fine arts. Eventually, I became a teacher in college. And uh, when I first was started, starting, uh, one of my uh, students happened to be uh, Greg LaRoque, the artist, mm -hmm. who I befriended. And he asked me if I wanted to draw comics. I said, yes. So I did some pinups for Who is Who in the Legion of Superheroes. I penciled them. Uh, one of them was published. The other one had already been done by somebody else. And that was thrilling. And then I got a call from an editor. Who, I don't know who it was. From DC and asked me to draw a backup story. Of uh, Green Arrow, I believe. And I turned it down. Uh, which... I was surprised, um, but I just was happy painting and I didn't want to do that. So a few years later, I befriended Jay Lee when I organized an exhibition of local comics art. And Jay asked me if I would do painted colors on his comics. I said, yes. So um, that's how my career in coloring comics began. Yeah, you, you had mentioned, uh, you know, getting recognition. And I do think that you are unique in the uh, sense that, you know, you are so uh, highly decorated and sought after. Um, you know, I feel like uh, because, uh, you know, what I had mentioned that I was going to talk to you to one of my artist friends who uh, was embarrassed that he didn't know your name. And um, I was like, yeah, because, you know, all his all the stuff he's worked on, you know, and it's like uh, you've worked with some of the greatest artists and comic books. Um, <clears throat> well, uh, I, I any... Go ahead. Oh, I, 
go ahead. No, I'll let you continue. Oh, well, that's very nice of you to say. I appreciate it. But, you know, honestly, I don't expect anyone to know who I am or what I do, even people that read a lot of comics. I think that knowing who the colorist in a series to me is similar to knowing who the cinematographer is in a movie. In other words, something that is very important and it affects the look of the product. But only people who have very um, detail-oriented minds are going to pay attention to such things. I follow cinematographers that I really like, but I know the majority of people don't. So um, and nobody should feel bad for not knowing who's a colorist um, at all. Um, it's just one more thing that... Um, contributes to the final product and if you like the product I'm flattered and uh, it doesn't matter if they know who did it right but I was also thinking though because um, you're also kind of unique in that I feel like a lot of um, and you do this too because of course it's part of the job but a lot of colorists are more uh, just working for the project that they're, they're on. But I feel like a colorist like you is somebody that if if somebody asks you to color something, they're looking for something very specific because you bring such a great, like different kind of mood to the work that I don't feel any other artist would. Do you know what I'm saying with that? Yes, I think, I think, you know, when I first started, I did one look, which was the look I was doing with Jay. And that's the look I enter the industry with. But over the years, it's been more than 25 or almost 30 years. I have a lot of different looks and I really custom the custom pick the colors to fit the project. In other words, I don't color Jay the way I color Pope Pope. And I don't color Paul Pope the way I color Corbin, and I don't color Corbin the way I color Jeff Lemire. Each one of them has their own style uh, of drawing, and they deserve their own palettes uh, of painting. Um, but yes, I do generally. People ask for me because they've seen something else that I've done that I like, but that can be very different things. Uh, uh, Joe Quinones asked for me to color America and that's because he liked the work I had done with Adam Hughes which was very airbrushy as Adam requested um, I had other people ask me to do more painterly style because they saw the work I did with Tomas Diarello in um, Conan for six years um, sometimes people ask me to use the kind of palette that I use with Pope Pope, but it depends. It, you know, each one is different. I think that what people know is that I'm able to do a variety of approaches. And I think that makes me more desirable as a as a contributor than somebody who only does one way. And that's all they do. Can I ask uh, what you did with Adam Hughes? Was it the Betty and Veronica? No. Yeah. Oh, oh, it was. Okay. Yeah, that looks beautiful. It, it looks very, because, uh, you know, uh, it, part of his wheelhouse, of course, is uh, Norman Rockwell, but that is kind of what it evoked for me in a lot of ways, um, you know, which was nice for that archy kind of nostalgia feel in a sense, but still looked modern and fresh at the same time. Um do you find it intimidating um, to color? Like, is it more intimidating to color somebody like Richard Corbin or Bill Sienkiewicz, which I guess you did, you know, initially years and years ago, of course, um, as opposed to somebody like an artist that people are less familiar with and maybe have less expectations? Because like, I imagine going into Sweet Tooth, you know, uh, aside from Jeff Lemire's direction, you have like a blank slate in a lot of ways. Indeed, I had carte blanche. Whenever I color somebody who doesn't work in color, then, you know, I just figure out a way they want me to do it and I do it. Uh, I was, this was many years ago, but the first job I got with Richard Corbin, I was a little intimidated because I'm such an admirer of his own actual color. But despite that, I knew exactly what I wanted to do with the colors and he actually was very kind and he guided me uh, 
to uh, certain things he wanted me to do and not do in the series. And, uh, and he gave me a beautiful presence and it was very, very nice. Um, Vincent Kevich, I was not intimidated. I'm a huge fan, but I saw how he was being colored at the time, which was not appropriate because he was like flat colors with some airbrush rendering. And I knew that it had to be colored the way he did his own painted work. So I just... I just jump right in because it, it would have been, you know, if you have a great drawing underneath, it's not really hard to basically continue it, which is what painted colors do. So um, I not, I'm not normally intimidated with my colors because the one thing about coloring is that digital coloring um, allows you to change what you do really easily. So I'm not afraid to try something. And then if people don't like it, then you try something else and then you come to an agreement and that's what you do. Many times people don't know how to express what they're looking for or they are not forceful enough in what they want uh, or they tell you do whatever you want, which normally means they're going to ask you to redo it. So, um, I mean, it's it's not, I think, you know, I think I'm pretty confident artistically anyways and um now that i've been doing this for so long i feel that um uh, i just um i just jump with both feet whenever i get an assignment um speaking of richard corbin um the one of the things uh, that i had saw you had posted recently that you're working on is uh scanning the art and um i guess remastering for the den collection for dark house horse um so what what kind of work is involved in that and are you you're basically just scanning it and uh, are you changing anything or oh uh and completely reconstructing the pages uh richard had a very unique way of working where he would do a page in black and white uh fully rendered in grays and then he would actually make handmade color separations with a stat camera that he had and so he would work by hand on the color plates so the color was not visible until he it was actually printed i know this because i'm a big fan and uh when dark horse reprinted um Creepy Presents Richard Corbin, I tried to amass as many scans of original art as possible so I could incorporate the detail of his original pages into the colors that they have been printed, printed with. Uh, Corbin himself helped me and some collectors helped me too. And uh, I know Corbin was very happy with what I did. So basically I did a lot of color correction, desaturated some of the pages, brought out the details in the dark areas, um, pick better color balances. These things were printed very poorly. So uh, that's the kind of thing I did. Now for, before doing then, I actually did Bloodstar and I went up to New York and I met with the owner of the original pages and scanned them right there. Then I digitally uh, corrected them and cleaned them up. I did some of that while I was scanning actually. And it's been published in France and it should be published here soon. And then for then, um, Corbin's Widow has uh, all the originals pretty much for most volumes except for volume three. So she's the one who actually did the scanning of the original art, sent it to me. And um, and I, um, I did the same thing that I had done for Dark Horse, uh, blending the detail of the original art with the uh, colors that so print, averaging the colors from different editions because each one was different. And I do have several printings of everything he did, including international editions, and just using my own judgment as well. Yeah, one of uh, <clears throat> one of the things that you uh, used to do frequently, and maybe you still do, and I just uh, haven't been following it, is uh, like, um, comparisons of like uh, remastered or recolored um, new comics. And it feels like uh, nine times out of 10, um, you know, the originals are always better. <laughs> oh yeah, well, that was like, 
during the pandemic, I was in sabbatical leave in Spain and I had this idea, I had posted some things about it before, but I started to do it systematically, which was to, uh, since I had a lot of time in my hands because I was in sabbatical and I couldn't do the trips that I had planned to do that year, I started to do this series called From a Colorist Perspective, which were a series of posts in Facebook where I would do a side-by-side -side comparison of how especially uh, Silver Age, but also Golden Age uh, and Bronze Age comics were printed originally versus what the main publishers have been doing in their reprints uh, in the past 30 years. And the colors are generally speaking um, completely different. They are much more saturated, they are darker, they're harsher. So um, I did over 400 posts. Anybody can check them out in Facebook if you go there. They're on an album. And then um, eventually, to my surprise, that led to a call from um, DC Comics, and they asked me to restore the classic run of Swamp Thing by Lynn Ween and Bernie Wrightson um, following the original colors, which had never been reprinted. And that was about a year ago. I did it as a, I had no time to do it. I really, really, I did it really fast. And now the book just came out this Christmas and um, I'm very happy with the results. Yeah, I've seen it on the shelves and uh, it looks beautiful. Uh, wow, yeah. that's like, what a great story. It's like, you're just doing, you know, because I was going to say, because I know you teach and, um, you know, <laughs> those Facebook posts are like an education in themselves. I mean, that is gorgeous. Yeah. That is so beautiful. Like they, they that, did a wonderful job with the edition in general, but just in very casual browsing, you can see that the the colors resemble it looks beautiful. They printed, you know, which Corbin and which uh, Wrightson did a lot of them himself. So I'm really, really happy. I'm gonna do a signing tomorrow in Frederick, Maryland. Well, congratulations. So I'm that's so amazing that uh, something like that uh, would lead to what must be like, uh, must have been like a, a dream call. I mean, you yes, know, I knew I, Bernie, you know, Bernie was from right from uh, Baltimore where I live. And I, I started uh, reading his work as a teenager. I did the monster coloring book was the first comic work I ever color, I guess, uh, when I was like 14 or 15. And I colored him in City of Others for Dark Horse, and I think he really liked the coloring I did on him. So it was sort of like, um, like I had a debt to to Bernie, who unfortunately passed away, to try to do justice to his best known work and to really restore it to what it looked like when it first came out and people read it. Uh, did you have you ever had the opportunity to color Bernie Wright's fan? Or? Yes, as I mentioned, I did in a graphic novel for Dark Horse called City of Others. Okay. Nice. Yeah, he, was, he was thrilled about the colors, but he was not the most talkative person. So I actually read an interview recently where he talked about how much he liked the colors I was doing. So I, I was very happy to hear that because when people tell you, they like your work in person, you never know if they're being polite. <laughs> Correct. But when they said in an interview that I haven't even read, then you know they're saying what they really think because they don't have to say it otherwise. Um, it, well, you know, I mean, I, I think that uh, you deserve all the accolades you get because uh, your work is beautiful. Another amazing contribution to the comics uh uh, world is uh, your long collaboration with uh, J.H. Williams on um, Promethea. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I can't even imagine what kind of, because I know an Alan Moore script has got to be dense as hell and like really hard to navigate. I can imagine how intimidating that would be as a, a penciler. So how, how I'm like, how, what kind of uh, like collaboration did J.H. Williams just let you go with it? Were you reading the scripts? Uh, I, obviously, you must be reading the scripts too to get some your information. Well, people think that I 
did all the coloring in Promethea, but that is not true. Uh, I was like the guest colorist. It was Jeremy Cox who did all of the issues and he did an amazing job. And he would get extremely detailed notes from both Alan and uh, JH. Uh, they called me for special things. So Alan wrote a photo collage segment on issue seven that uh, I shot models and collaged them together in Photoshop. And um, that he wrote for me. So um, JH just drew the transitional pages uh, based on my photos. And that was really easy to work with JH because he was also a friend. Um, later on, JH asked me to do watercolor painted colors, like physically watercolor painted colors over this one issue where all the pages connected and Jeremy did the rest. So I did about a third, the bottom third of each page and he did the rest. When uh, I also did several things with JH in terms of, we did an homage to Maxfield Parish. We did an homage to Dali, Salvador Dali. And, um, and at the end of the series, when the characters quote unquote, become real, meaning they are rendered much more three-dimensionally. Um, he asked me to come in and do the last few issues to wrap it up, as I did also for Tom Strong. And so um, the other thing is Alan actually asked me to work on painted covers for all of the hardcover collections. So uh, JH did some pencil drawings and I painted the covers of the hardcovers in watercolor and gouache, and then now uh, digitize them. I did the same thing with um, Chris Prowse uh, and Tom Strong and Gene Ha in top 10. Um, I even color Arthur Adams, uh, Tomorrow Stories, and probably something else that I'm forgetting. So anyway, I was kind of like a guest artist in Promethea doing, you know, Charles Vess also did a uh, guest stint. Um, doing one of the early stories. And um, uh, yeah, Alan would give me detailed directions. And JH didn't for Promethea. He gave me very detailed directions for Desolation Jones, which we did together for the first story arc before it was canceled. Well, and that was, I mean, you also, didn't you work with uh, Alan Moore on a short story? Um, I forget the name. It's uh, for an anthology, like an LGBT story, perhaps. No, I uh, adapted uh, the script from a comic that he had done for a fundraising book uh, called ARG, which was to fight homophobia in England during the Thatcher years. And he wrote a poetic um his poetic version of uh, the history of uh, same-sex love. He called it the mirror of love. And he published it first in comic form and then as a poem in a magazine called Rapid Eye, issue number three. I had read it. Um, my friend David Drake and I did an adaptation that I performed on the stage of the text for a queer theater festival. And then um, I did uh, a book version of the poem uh, which Alan really loves. And when he does readings in high schools and stuff, and stuff, oftentimes he takes a copy and reads from the book. Um, so that was, it's been translated to French, Italian, and Spanish. Uh, recently, to three years ago, it was reprinted in Italy at a larger size. And uh, it's a very beautiful um, and moving uh, retelling that we've seen a lot of historical figures um, and uh, really uh, Alan did it as a very personal project and it really shows. That's so cool. Did, um, are there any uh, other like uh, creators or artists or writers that you haven't had the chance to work with that are on your list that you might like to work with writers or artists uh both i guess um i mean i guess artists more prominently because um it feels like that is uh your biggest uh collaboration i mean i mean in terms of writers i work with so many wonderful ones um i've only done one thing with neil gaiman i'd like to do more um 
the in terms of um of artists um i keep finding new artists that i want to work with that are just coming up i think that a lot of the ones that i wanted to work with i have worked with and um i can't think of the top of my head generally speaking as a fan whenever an artist can color themselves i rather them color themselves than me color them because i like their colors uh even if they're very different from what i do um so it's basically artists that don't color themselves like paul hope or jeff which does some watercolor sometimes but doesn't really color himself that um are good to work with because you're not replacing the colors they would have done for themselves, but just, I feel like you're actually adding something to the, to the work that they do. So uh, I was talking to someone recently, we were talking about how the, there really aren't any superstar comic book artists anymore, but there are still a lot of good comic book artists out there. Um, are there, who are some of the newer comic book artists that appeal to you that you've been sort of gotten your attention? There no more superstar comic book artists anymore. Uh, as far as you know, like I feel like you know the '90s was like uh, you know the heyday for the Wizard Top Ten and things like that. And I feel I, I like just my personal opinion. I sort of feel like uh, you know after uh, the Marvel superstars left to form Image, I feel like they were a little more wary of that and you know less uh, focused on making the the book about the artist than you know more about the characters and arguably i mean it should be about the characters i guess but if you love comic book art and artists like you know people like us do then i imagine you know you're following artists rather than comics or or you know maybe both i've always followed artists um and in terms of super superstar artists there i think there are plenty my friend olivier Guapel, uh my friend Frank Whiteley, I think it's an absolute superstar. I think Brian Hitch is a superstar. I think Jim Lee continues to be a superstar. Uh, Frank Miller, when he works, uh, he's on the absolute top echelon. So I think that they are still, it's just what happens like that fandom part of Wizard that was very like uh, bracketing everything in terms of like lists, uh, that died. Uh, but I think it's been replaced by a much broader uh, appreciation of what uh, comics do. And, you know, you have uh, one of our ex-students, Noel Stevens. They were, um, they are absolute superstar. Um, Sarah Anderson, uh, who is another one of our students, who does Sarah Scribbles. She is an international superstar. It's just that she doesn't do superheroes. And so when I think about comics, I think about comics with a large C. And um, I think that uh, Alison Betchel, you know, people like that, it's like you don't get to be more respected and uh, greater than they are. Uh, but yeah, those, those artists that I mentioned before that do superheroes, um, I think they're still, they're still um, top tier. And uh, and I think that uh, the sales reflect it, reflect it when they do, when they take over a series, etc. I also think that um, because um, James Gunn has taken that approach to announce what he's going to do with the DC universe based on particular arcs by particular creators, mostly Graham Morrison, I feel that... Uh, those books have increased size, sales like crazy. And uh, just like Ryan continues to be a superstar writer, um, I think that they are um, Brian K. Vaughan, Fiona Staples, and Saga. Um, you know, there's so many that I think are absolutely on top. Uh, in terms of work, I work with Fiona. She's wonderful. Um, I work, you know, Vince always works with his friend, Jamie Grant. Uh, Vince is Frank Whiteley. Uh, I work with Olivier, but he has really excellent coloring right now. Um, so, you know, um, I think that the 
Pandem hasn't died. I think it's just transformed. And, sure, the landscape's uh, just different. Yes, Have you so, ever colored Frank Whiteley? No, because no. he always work, works with Jamie Grant. Um, yeah. And so we're very good friends. Um, he's come to Baltimore to visit me. And, um, you know, we are really, really um, friendly. And I love his work. Um, but I love when he colors himself. That's another one that I don't think I could ever, ever even approach. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm totally with you. Like, I, I always prefer, like, if a, uh, a penciler inks his own pencils. Mm -hmm. I prefer if a colorist colors their own work. Um, uh, um, I was curious, because, uh, uh, you know, you talk about recoloring and remastering and all this stuff. And if, if even though I do prefer when a colorist colors their own work, um, <clears throat> I think one of the most di divisive recoloring perhaps is the killing joke. Um, how do you, I feel, I know you've commented on it before and I apologize for making you repeat yourself, but uh, what was your take on that? Cause the, mm -hmm. the original is so iconic in a way, even though it's very garish, but you know, and Brian Bolland's uh, color technique is undeniably beautiful and they both look great, but they're both very different. I think that, you know, um, DC did the right thing, letting Brian recolor it and publishing that deluxe edition that has both versions. I feel the story um, makes more sense with the original color because the story is very hallucinatory and nonsensical. Uh, the whole section of the story that takes place in the amusement park is absolutely impossible you wouldn't find small people to wear those costumes and be your henchmen and this is completely not realistic and i feel that um the colors enhance that irreality and they sort of they were very strong and i'm really surprised editorially that uh Brian Boland wasn't informed of how it was being colored. I don't think I have ever colored anything that the artist wasn't aware of what I was doing. So something happened there editorially that's very odd. <clears throat> I think that the the recoloring by Brian is impeccably done technically, but narratively, I think it's uh, it doesn't add anything to the drawings. It's just um, it could may as well be in black and white. So I think that is his work, is his prerogative, as I said, but he's, it's not all, only his work, it's also Alan's story. And even though Alan hates that story, uh, he did something very great for the time in terms of like twisting the Batman Joker mythos and giving the Joker a decent origin story, which he never had before. So um, my answer is that I think that um, in terms of what I prefer, it's uh, the psychedelic colors, but that doesn't mean they're better than what the other colors look like. And I respect people that like the other ones. I think that both of them um, are um, very thoughtfully done. I agree 100%. Um, have, has, uh, has Swamp Thing led to other recolorings or um, are there other uh, books that like uh, would interest you to remaster or recolor perhaps? I'm open to suggestions. Um, I talked to the editor the other day. He's so happy because people are saying this is the first book they're done like that. And uh, he's saying that they would like to do more, but they have so many volumes uh, that they're doing. They're really like, they have to put out a lot of product and they're always overwhelmed. So he has to see also what they can get some original art scans before commissioning something. Um, the one thing I've been asking for about a decade to do is uh, all of the Conan the Barbarian story by Barry Smith. I ask Dark Horse, I ask Marvel, and I'm at desk. I ask Heroic Signatures with who is publishing the character now. Um, 
maybe it will happen. It's a big project because it's 24 issues. So it would be a huge endeavor. But um, Barry Smith actually went back and recolored some of the early stories that he hadn't colored himself. So a volume could be made that had either the original coloring, if he was in part by Barry Smith, and the recolorings that he did later on of the early stories. And I think it would look very, very beautiful. That would um, be. I would love to color, <coughs> recolor The Shadow um, by Mike Kaluda. And uh, uh, that would be a dream control. I would love to color, recolor things that would never be done in this format, like uh, Michael Luda's Carson of Venus strip. It's one of my favorite things ever. Um, and of course, I would love to do Neil Adams. Uh, I would love to do any of his Marvel or DC work. Um, the issue there being that uh, DC has published the remaster versions that Neil himself did where he redrew large sections of the stories and actually changed all the coloring that he had done originally to very three-dimensional, intense, dark colors. And so, um, like the Kling joke, I think that both versions could coexist. How do you feel about um, modern coloring in comics? I think some of it's really good and some of it's really scary. Like some of it's like way too heavy on like the effects. I feel like it's like just over rendered. And um, one of the things is like, uh, I was just reading like a, there's a new Avengers series uh, penciled and inked by Alan Davis. Of course, the Alan Davis work is beautiful. And the coloring is, my question mark you know what i mean i feel like mm -hmm. he said sort of old school and i feel like a, an artist like him and like i hate to see someone like john Byrne like get like a super modern coloring with a lot of rendering and airbrushing and stuff i just i don't know why it just looks so off to me how do you do you feel that uh old school guys like that should be colored like more flat or a specific way or no, there aren't any rules. <laughs> there are no rules. I feel like if John Byrne wants to do something that looks completely airbrush and 3D, he should, just like Neil did with his old comics. I think that to me, whatever the artist wants is the most respectable opinion. Whether one likes it or not afterwards, that's another matter. But I would never say it shouldn't happen. I think it should happen. And I trust the artist more than I trust uh, the editor or the marketing people, which often make decisions about these things. I certainly trust the artist more than I trust the fans, which includes all of us. And I think that the artist's decision should always be um, the ultimate word in whatever they're doing. In terms of uh, fully rendered, full of effects, uh, coloring, do uh, you have a lot of everything like you always have had? There's some people that do absolutely breathtaking work um, with um, highly polished, highly rendered um, color work. And I admired. And I know the artists who they do it with normally adore it. So um, it's not the way I personally work because I'm not that good at that kind of thing. Um, but I, I have a lot of admiration for people who do that. And generally speaking, I think that uh, coloring in comics has never been better than it is right now. I think that the the range, I discover new colorists very, very frequently um, from all over the world that are working for American market. And I'm just, um, I'm amazed of the work that they do. I think there is a lot of skill in how comics are being colored now. And um, I feel that, um, as I said, not everybody, maybe everybody's cup of tea, but I think the standard in coloring has been raised 
enormously in the years I've been in the industry. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's also kind of cool. You know, you talk about like uh, Brian Boland, um, who uh, I forgot at one point, but he works exclusively digitally, you know, penciling, mm-hmm. inking, um, Dave Gibbons as well. And, um, you know, it's so cool to see some of the like artists who had careers for years and years just be adaptable um, and uh, make the transition um, like like even yourself, you know, uh, having a hand painted Hell Shock and then going to learn um, digital, you know, it, uh, I think of something like the Dark Knight, you know, it's like Lynn Varley doing gouache on the first one and this beautifully painted to doing Dark Knight Strikes Again, which was her first digital color work. And, you know, speaking of divisive uh, coloring, what was your reaction to it when you first saw it? I love it. That's like totally my wheelhouse. I love bright garish colors like that. I thought it was so cool and unlike anything I've ever seen before. Yeah, the the, the second that I returns. Do you do you recall like how oh, bright yeah. and crazy uh, uh, it was? Yeah. And and I think I think they were playing. You know, it felt like an indie comic with the mainstream character. And I think that the expectation was something highly polished like the first series and then Frank was in drawing polish and Lynn was having fun with the computer Uh, I felt like it was more like an alternative um, aesthetic than than regular I personally uh, didn't object to it or enjoy it I felt it was fine I think that again it's like what he and his wife at the time wanted to do and uh, I'm glad they were allowed to do it uh, because I would have hated to see them repeat the same thing they did in the first volume. Um, I was thinking before when you were talking about the Polish work, there is a Spanish artist named Tomeo More, and his coloring, who is extremely complex, is absolutely spectacular. Um, he takes a long time for each page that he does. And to me, he's the pinnacle of like really manipulated um, work in the images. And I know that all the artists that work with him, many of which are friends of mine, are absolutely in awe of his talent and his modesty. Um, and then so the people like Laura Martin, who I love, um, and she's done beautiful um, digital color for many years since. Yeah, she's a genius. I love her work. And, um, you know, there's uh, there's a lot of really, really, really strong Color is right now. Uh, who works Jordi, Jordi Belair comes to mind. Jordi Belair is absolutely excellent uh, and prolific. Uh, and um, yeah, this just, it's a really good landscape for coloring right now. Have you ever uh, colored Frank Miller before? I guess it seems like a crime if you haven't. <laughs> no, I never have. You know, the we- thing. Uh, we, 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 you need to make that happen or the <laughs> universe needs to make that happen. I think that he really <laughs> likes uh, being colored by Alex Sinclair, my friend at DC, and, and he does, he's always great. And uh, he's also being colored by Dave Stewart for Dark Horse because Dave's still kind of like their in-house colorist. And um, I don't know if, I, I don't know if, if Frank Miller would like the way I would color him because uh I always try to mimic the uh, the marks that the artist does in their drawings, but with the brush or the digital brush. And he's also graphic. And from what I see in the way he gets colored, he likes extremely polished coloring, like very 3D, very rendered, very textured, like um, very complex coloring instead of like his very simple kind of line. and. I think that would be hard for me to to do on on his work, um, but you know, absolutely. Uh, my phone lines are open, of course. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, I just interviewed Dan DiDio not too long ago, so maybe I'll throw a bug in his ear because I'd mm-hmm. love to see that collaboration for sure. It, I, it just surprises me because you worked with people like uh, you know Bill Sienkiewicz and 
Jay Lee. And it just seems like Frank's art would just be like such a beautiful open playground for such a, a like amazing mind like yours when it comes to, you know, slapping down the color. Speaking of which, um, one, like one of the last things I want to talk to you before we wrap it up is, uh, you know, like, is there some sort of advice you would give um, aspiring colorists, um, uh, like uh, on how you approach a page or a story, like what your thought process is or um, your procedure for uh, approaching a book or a new story that you're going to color? Yes. Uh, my advice for a new colorist is less is more. Meaning, don't try to put every color in every page. That never looks good. So really rein in your palettes so it does what you need to do in each scene. Um, that's a very normal mistake that young colorists tend to do is like they want to show off how many colors they can use. And that's not the best for storytelling. The other thing, which is a very... Typical rookie mista mistake, it's look at the drawing and figure out what the light source is in the drawing and only do that light source. Don't add your own light sources uh, that sometimes contradict that. So if a figure has like a black shape in one side of the face, then put a highlight on the opposite side. Don't try to put the highlight after the shadow because that's not going to look good or don't do a front tool kind of lighting because it won't look good because that's not how it was drawn. So I think taking drawing lessons is super important. Learning to paint in traditional media is super important. Uh, taking color theory classes is super important. And uh, learning how to resolve um, single pictures in ways that enhances the mood in different ways, and then you can do sequential. So if you can do a single illustration that looks sad and melancholic, and one that looks fun and festive, and one that looks um, morbid or uh, scary, then you'll be able to do a sequence that looks like a single picture. But if you don't even know how to do a single picture yet, just keep learning, take more classes, do more tutorials, uh, it's not about who uses Photoshop best or, you know, other programs right now like Procreate or Clip Studio. It's about what's inside of your head and um, how much practice you have in um, in creating mood, which is 90% of what storytelling is. So do you care to weigh in on the AI controversy? It seems like uh, a lot of people are <laughs> posting... Uh, you know, uh, these uh, generated, AI generated art, um, you know, and of course artists are losing their mind because it's the, the, the you know, it, the, these things generate art based on, you know, curated art from all other artists. And um, I don't know, I, I think they're pretty bad. What do you think of them? Uh, I think that the whole thing is, I'm, I understand why people are so passionate for and against it. Um, I see it a little bit differently, um, but, you know, a lot of it is context. So, for example, in our classes at MICA, where I teach, I actually alerted everybody when stable diffusion and stuff like, well, actually with Wombo Art, I was already talking to faculty. And I alerted them to be in the lookout so students don't sneak AI art in their homework. And eventually I drafted language to put in our syllabi for departmental rules about not using AI for assignments. But we're not telling the students they shouldn't use AI for their own enjoyment. That would be yeah. absurd. They can do whatever they want with their time. I think that um, in terms of artists working with AI, uh, I think that the challenge right now is that a lot of artists, uh, not a lot, but I see some artists that are presenting finished work that I totally see that is Mid Journey version four, to be specific. 
and they're presenting it as their own work. Sometimes they put their own copyright and stuff, and it is their own work because Midjourney lets you own whatever you do. Um, but uh, I feel that, well, you know, it's it's a neat trick. Uh, I don't know how used those images are going to be in terms of going to print. I think that for concept art, which is not seen, um, production art, there is an actual threat. Uh, that's why Carla Ortiz has been, you know, raising the alarm, and she's correct. I think comics are a little bit too insignificant for anybody to make an artificial intelligence to recreate them. So um, right now it's it's all new. Um, there is a lot of fear of the unknown and where this will go. Uh, it reminds me a lot of like early uh, filters for photographs in um, first in Photoshop when you turn things into a watercolor and then like to post images you would turn it into like a old timey high contrast image and I remember doing that like for several months and then everybody completely forgot about those because that was such a tired tired look so I feel <clears throat> I think that to a certain extent uh, some of the Artificial intelligence imagery is going to have the same tired look once people, when the novelty wears off. Um, you know, it, oh, go ahead. I, I also believe that um, things are developing fast uh, and there's a lot of legal maneuvering to stop the companies. Um, and I understand all that. One of my alum, uh, Sarah Anderson, has written a big article in the New York Times about the dangers for cartoonists like herself, and I totally support her. Um, she's in the class, uh, that uh, class action suit uh, with Carla Ortiz and another illustrator. Um, I think that <clears throat> my personal belief is that eventually things would fall into their place. And I think eventually there would be a way to, uh, for artists to employ a certain facets of artificial intelligence to construct their work without making the artificial intelligence art generated imagery dominated but more like uh, help the process like another tool in the toolbox but we're not there yet so you know that's me being optimistic or pollyanna or whatever but that's what i really think no, there's a lot of wisdom in um, all of that. And uh, one of the things that kind of uh, was like uh, an aha moment for me was when you talked about uh, having to sort of monitor it as a teacher, because I would have never, that would have never occurred to me that, yes, of course, uh, an art student could use it to cheat their homework. And that is crazy. That uh, would be a great like plot line in a movie almost or something like that. But um, yes, and, and all our students are in Discord. They actually have the student clubs in Discord. So I know that many of them are, you know, um, they have either subscriptions or they're using the free versions of like um, artificial intelligence imagery um, um, programs. So, you know, I think I understand why people are very, very, very upset and against it. I also understand people that are playing with it and they're having fun with it. I even understand the people that are slapping their copyrights with their name and trying to pass it as their own work. Um, I understand all of it. <laughs> I feel that uh, uh, that doesn't mean I, uh, I'm in any particular band because um, I think that, I think to me it's nuanced. And whereas I would not want to, for example, have my students not learn how to paint in watercolor because they're doing digital, I teach a watercolor class. Well, this is a completely different experience to like getting a watercolor painting, even though you can get really good, in quotes, uh, facsimiles of watercolors. In It's kind of like going to Google search and finding a watercolor pretty much. So um, I... I understand that, but um, I think the students 
my students in particular really, really don't care for AI. Like they don't care for NFTs or, you know, cyber currency or anything like that, which are all very linked. And uh, they're very, very happy, especially now that we're back to having in-person classes to actually make things with their hands. And even the process it later, you know, in Procreate or uh, Photoshop, they liked making physical things. And they're very excited about that from coming from being isolated at home, working on their tablet. Yeah, it's funny because, you, you know, you talk about the progress of like Photoshop and um, digital tools and stuff. It's like, uh, uh, you know, like in Procreate, like I think of or or any digital, you know, how like uh, you don't have to draw clouds anymore or you don't have to draw uh, a space with stars. But if you look at like, you know, John Byrne and Terry Austin's artist edition and see like the little work that goes into every star and, you know, dot on that page. It's like, I feel like, you know, like there are certain hallmarks of comic book artists that are unique to them, like the way they draw a cityscape or the way they draw clouds or the way they draw the BWS, the black with the stars. And, um, you know, some of that is lost to Photoshop in a way, you know, I think there's room for both. The other thing that I uh, lament though is, you know, um, like comic books aren't lettered traditionally anymore. And, you know, you won't have artist editions anymore because all the art is digital. And there is just something about holding an original comic art board that's like just transformative and kind of magical that you don't get in digital. Do you ever work, uh, do you work exclusively digital now or do you still work traditionally? You know, I work, I work, um, and for the coloring, I, I work digitally, uh, but sometimes I do illustration work for posters and for, I just did a cover for an image series that I'm doing, and that's all painted by hand, in watercolor and, and acrylic. So I work both. Uh, I do demos all the time at school of, like, different painting techniques as well. So um, um, I think that uh, uh, many artists know that when you work your, when you draw your pages by hand, it may take a little longer, but then you have another cash revenue because you can sell those originals. And so I think I know a lot of artists that don't work digitally because of that. And I think that um, what you gain in, exper in experience, uh, you lose in like having the the particular object afterwards. So again, you know, I don't lament it. I really feel that they should do whatever they want, whatever works for them. I would never want somebody to tell me don't use Photoshop, use, you know, Illustrator. So um, I don't, whatever they want to do is fine. We have plenty of original art to make more, many, many more beautiful artist editions that haven't come out and many probably won't. And um, no art, it's, you know, artists see it as, as, process work and uh, is not meant to be seen without color to begin with and much less in an artist edition which is kind of like a relic from the way comics have been done all these years yes <laughs> i know it is it's like being an archaeologist uh, looking through those and i love it i have a ton um, so i mean i love them too i'm working there... on, i'm getting uh, I'm really working very hard on trying to get uh, Corbin's classic work as artist editions. Uh, one is coming out uh, in France, but it's impossible to get and extremely expensive. But I want affordable artist editions of Blood Star and Den and Arabian Nights and Witten World, etc. I have some of those pages and they're just beautiful to look at. Even though it would erase you, I would love to see a, a banner um, uh, artist edition of Me Richard too. Corbin. Me I'm too. sure Scott Dunbeer would do it in a heartbeat. <laughs> when uh, those first pages, Richard actually sent them to me because he didn't have a scanner at the time or it was broken or whatever. I remember opening the box and it was this beautiful splash page of um, Cage in the strip club. It was just like mind blown, like the printed version that we did doesn't do it justice. And so, um, yeah, I'm, I'm all for 
I really have like maybe 30 or 40 artist editions. Uh, so I, I really love them. Uh, and I have, yeah. a lot of, I have a lot of original art, a lot. Yeah. Uh, I know. I, I during the pandemic, I uh, started to collect some original art, but um, it's so expensive. <laughs> it's gotten so expensive. I think of all the original art I passed on over the years and um, just kick myself. But um, well, I think that the thing is that the uh, <clears throat> it's you know you can get like a page by Jim Lee that doesn't have superheroes or whatever for under a thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it's like some random cover from Marvel by a random artist who is not nearly as good as Jim Lee, then it's like $20,000, $30,000. Right. And it's like, um, well, I don't buy covers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I own a single cover. And I, I, I you know, I'm not a uh, fan of the characters, particularly. I don't mind them, but I'm, I, don't, I follow the artists. I don't follow the characters. So um, I, uh, I'm very happy buying pages from or with or like I, I'm looking at a Kevin Nolan I have right now that I bought, and it's from this fashion sp spread that he did in Details magazine with like two guys in the bathroom, and uh, I framed it. I absolutely loved it. And then I have a John Romita Senior comic strip framed over there that he gave me as a present once, and you know I have like Martin Sarah. You know, I have some things here, but I have, I have a ton. I have a lot of stuff. Um, Very cool. I'm like a, I don't like to spend, I don't have, you know, the money to spend in anything that's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. I just, you know. Right. I, I don't really <laughs> even understand how people can spend $50,000 in something, anything. Um, I know, it's crazy. <laughs> I just don't know what kind of income they have. I just don't have that income. I mean, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very comfortable, but I can't blow, you know, 50K and something I like. Nothing. Yeah. Like anything, period. Yeah, it's very extravagant. I know I can't even afford a house, so let alone a $50,000 page of comic book art. <laughs> so many of those pages are worth more than houses. Like, I know, it's crazy. Maybe. It's kind of amazing. Um I mean, on one hand, you think if, if they would have known, uh, they could have saved all of them. But then again, if they would have made the proper expectations, then maybe they wouldn't be worth as much now. Huh? Well, I think that a lot of them, you know, there was a gray area for a long time about uh, who they belong to, uh, because Marvel would keep theirs and DC would keep them. And... It wasn't clear because it was considered production work. So many were chopped up and, you know, used for like to cut with an exacto knife on top and stuff. And it really was Neil Adams who uh, who used his cloud in the 70s and um, who actually forced the companies to return their artwork to their creators um, and um, really start to value what those pieces were but you know 99.9 percent .9 of the pieces that you bought that you can buy are pieces that there was no income that went to the artists who did it they were kept by the publisher or somebody in the office or they would suddenly would give them as presents to people that came to the office and so they that's one thing that neil was very adamant about that all this work was stolen from him and it was literally it was and yet nobody would return it to him. So same thing happened with Corbin, since it's happened with like all of those old timers. So um, there's a famous thing that happened with Jack Kirby when Marvel wouldn't return all those originals that they have unless he signed off the rights to Captain America. So um, yeah, their hands are very dirty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So what uh what's on your uh, like plate? Uh, I know you're working on the den. Is that pretty much filling your time now? Do you have anything coming out soon, or any other projects you're working on? This morning I was finishing the epilogue of the second volume of Den that I just finished writing, and um, I am in the process of um, uploading all the pages which finally are approved into the server and doing the design work. I started working on the third volume of them. That's the one I posted about that not all the pages are available and I'm doing like a 
scavenger hunt. <clears throat> I'm going to be writing a long essay in each one of the Corbin books. I um I have been working on a series for Dark Horse that was for a video game company, and they just canceled it, so it will never come out. It's uh-huh. too bad because I was working with a friend of mine whose work I really like, Mark Chatter. Um, Mark Chatter, English artist, we did Sword Daughter together. I am uh, <clears throat> in the midst of doing a 100-page graphic novel for Dark Horse. Is by two legendary creators, the writer and the artist, and uh, it's a horror series, uh, classic, very classic, very gory, very psychedelic. I'm having a blast. I can't say anything else until it's announced. Damn, what a tease. That sounds awesome. <laughs> it's really, it's like a dream project, and they're letting me go crazy. They, they actually push me to go crazy with the colors. I never do anything crazier, so it's fun. Um, I'm also working, uh, I'm going to be starting to work on a creator-owned series for Comixology with my friend Pablo Raimondi in in New York. And uh, we were working together for a year on a project that never came out, so I'm glad to do a mystery series. It hasn't been announced. I'm finishing up a series that has been announced, which is Dead Romans for um, Image. And it's a historical series that I'm doing with a friend of mine who's a Canadian artist, uh, who does beautiful tonal work, very moody, kind of uh, very atmospheric work, uh, very painterly. And that's been a delight. And... um, Oh, of course, I'm doing Conan with Rob De La Torre. For Titan Comics and Heroic Signatures, we did the Free Comic Book Day one, and we're in the midst of doing... The first issue of the series is going to be monthly, and he's doing, like, the job of his career. He's doing, like, the best Conan since Tomas Diarello uh, did the one for Dark Horse that I work. So... I'm also doing other series that haven't been announced with Rory Howard characters. And oh, and I'm editing uh, a biography of a gay artist with uh, a writer, a friend of mine, and uh, a French artist. So um, that's something I'm very excited about because uh, that's creator own and I edited and art directed and uploaded it like I did with um, Infidel. So that's very, very exciting. And I don't know if I'm doing something else. I might. I don't know. Not today, but... Uh... <laughs> well, you sound quite busy with a lot of exciting projects that we can look forward to. Um, I encourage people to follow you on Facebook to look for um, your um, coloring comparisons. It's like... Uh, you know, a free education in itself. Um, I wish you continued success with all the amazing projects you. that you have coming. Um, I look forward to that uh, Richard Corbin artist editions that you're going to help manifest all over the place. Um, and uh, I encourage people to look out some of your great works and just study the beautiful contributions to comic books that you've made over the years. It was such thank an you. honor to finally talk to you. And I really oh, my pleasure. thank you so much for your time. And thank I appreciate you. you. Thanks so much, Jose. Thank you.